All right. Looks like we're now live for the Hegel party. Uh, I see there's already some people here. I'm sure we're going to be joined by others in a bit. And what I had planned for this is uh, fairly unstructured. I'm going to talk about the inception and motive for the half hour Hegel project, some of the issues we ran into over the years, um, how we dealt with those, what's coming up next, um, not for half hour Hegel, but for similar kinds of projects and maybe, you know, some other things that occur to me along the way. I see a few people already commenting. Feel free to comment or leave questions, and I will try to get to as many of those as I can. Zeitgeist has kind of a funny one. I can feel the power of Hegel coming inside me. Um, I mean, I don't know what the power of Hegel would be at this point in time. He's been dead and gone for not quite two centuries, but getting on there. Although, you know, there's, there's, we could say that there's something contained in his works, right, that is coming through. And maybe that might be an interesting broader topic because it's not just about Hegel, but about what we get out of reading in general, including what, what Hegel thinks that we get out of studying other philosophers. So, you know, why don't I start by talking about why I did the project in the first place and what a crazy thing it was to commit to doing. Um, glad we finally got it to, to the end. So about nine and a half years ago, actually, I got to back up a little bit further. About 10 years ago, I had, um, you know, people asking me as my YouTube videos of my class sessions at Marist College were becoming quite popular um, there were people who were saying, can you do videos on this person or this person or this person? And eventually I decided, you know what I need to do is actually like poll people and, and see what they, they want done. And interestingly, so Jean-Paul Sartre was a big favorite, Martin Heidegger, another big favorite, uh, you know, Hegel was a, a third. And then the other one that people were big on at the time that I've never done any videos on, Herbert Marcuse who I was kind of a fan of back in undergraduate and early graduate school, but haven't done much with since, other than being in a short reading group on, on One Dimensional Man. And so, you know, I, I started doing this existentialist series, and you might have seen some of the videos for that, quite a few on, on um, you know, uh, Sartre and some on um, Heidegger, Kierkegaard, Nietzsche, Gabriel Marcel, Shestoff, people like that. And I figured, well, that's got the Sartre and Heidegger covered. Now, what should I do for Hegel? And I thought, you know, I can't do quite the same thing as I'm doing, say, for Nietzsche's Birth of Tragedy, where I'm like going through portions of it in an hour long video and doing a lot of summarizing. That's not going to work for say, Hegel's Phenomenology of Spirit. And the Phenomenology of Spirit is the text that I thought of doing because it's probably the most popular at this point in time. Although I should mention that in the 19th century, the Phenomenology was not the most widely read. It was other works by, by Hegel. So um, I, I thought, okay, I'm going to do the Phenomenology. How can I do this well? How can I do something that isn't going to be just, you know, surface level. So I thought, okay, I got to do line by line commentary, what we call a close reading and not leave anything out because it's tempting when you get to difficult parts of a work to say, yeah, you could say something about this, but I'm going to skip over it and then jump to another part. And I thought that's kind of a cop out. I don't want to do that with Hegel. And, and I did have the background in Hegel to be able to do it. I almost wrote my dissertation on uh, Hegel and Maurice Blondel. I had to take a, a preliminary exam as special thinker on Hegel, one of the four exams that I had to do before I could qualify to do my uh, dissertation. And that involved essentially memorizing all the dialectics of the phenomenology and some, some you know, reading around in, in the science of logic and a few other texts. 
so I had the chops to do it. Um, I'm not the best Hegel scholar out there in part because I do a lot of different things. And so, you know, I don't have the single mindedness of people who concentrate primarily on Hegel or who may have a wider range, but, you know, still spend more time with Hegel and less time doing undergraduate teaching people who get to like specialize and just teach graduate students, but nobody else is doing videos. So I thought, all right, how should I do this? And then I thought about the time frame. Should I do it in like hour long videos? And I'd already started experimenting with these core concept videos that are shorter. And then I was like, I don't want to do hour long videos. I think it'd be better if they're about half an hour long, right? So how should I do this? Well, I'll have a little musical <clears throat> intro. I'll use PowerPoint to make some slides. Um, people should actually read the text. So I'll start out with some, you know, passages from the text and then I'll uh, comment on it in front of my chalkboard, right? And after a while, you know, I get through the preface, which is pretty long. And then I was like, you know, I need to do something with a different background maybe. And so I started experimenting with these sorts of things. If you've watched the series, you see that obviously like the video quality has improved over time as I moved from a flip cam to uh, a, another uh, camera, uh, a Hero GoPro, and then to a, another Hero GoPro that I have now. Um, sound quality has improved once I started using a mic, but you know, it's all understandable, I hope. And hopefully these videos will be around as a resource for uh, a number of, of years. Uh, Barbara says in nine years, technology itself improved over time. That, that's quite true. You know, like the hero camera has gotten better, but I also, um, you know, I, I started out low tech. I, I've never been a video channel that does high production stuff because I think that um, people spend a lot of time and money on glitz and not enough on actual content. And, you know, I mean, think about here's a metaphor for you. Here's my, my book. And people have noted, oh, it's getting tattered and worn and stuff like that. Yeah, but the words are still there. And until those words are lost, it's, you know, it's decent enough for, for me to use. So, um so anyway, back to like the inception of it. So I started filming and then I was like, all right, this is going along pretty good. And eventually I decided to create a, a Patreon for it. I did that before I did my regular Patreon. By the way, the Half Hour Hegel Patreon, not, not right now, but in, in the future is going to be going away and rolling into my regular Patreon because the, the project is is finished. And I, I thank all the people who have helped me out along the way, uh, not only financially, but in terms of encouragement and sharing the videos and talking up the series and stuff like that. So, you know, that, that's, that's really quite great. And, um, you know, I kept plowing away at it. And there have been times when I've had to put it kind of on hold because of either uh, health issues or being overloaded with work. You know, there have been semesters where I've taught seven classes at different uh, institutions and actually turned some classes down. So all of these other things can kind of get in the way. And, you know, shooting videos on Hegel is is not the easiest thing compared to some of the other thinkers. I've, I've had times where I put things on the chalkboard, got ready to present, you know, I'm, I'm rereading the paragraph and I get in front of the chalkboard, I'm all dressed up as usual. And then I'm like, oh, I can't do it today. I, I, I don't, I can't follow the train of thought. So then I had to put it on, on hold and try the next day. Right. So, all right. So that's, that's probably enough about the start. Let's, let's look at the questions and comments and then I'll, I'll uh, get into some other things. Um, so a lot of congratulations. Thanks for that. Uh, <laughs> that's a good one by Philosoph Philosoph Cultist, the absolute ideal party. So that's a great joke. Um, people have got questions or suggestions about who to talk. I'm going to do next. I'll, I'll talk about that in just a bit. Um, 
Scotty says, any interest in interpreting or reviewing some more niche philosophers such as Levinas or Deleuze? I've actually shot videos on Deleuze. Just got to search in the channel. Not a huge fan of Levinas, um, in part because the Levinasians that I encountered in grad school left such a bad taste in my mouth because they were constantly talking about the other and its face and how we're betraying it and theory is all hypocrisy. And I understand that Levinas is more than that, but sometimes, you know, you you look at the, the interpreters and followers and you can be like, eh, not really my scene there, you know. Um, Francis, the absolute has been attained, you know, according to Hegel, yeah, by the end of the book, but whether that's really the case or not, we have to think that through. Um, Ludus Van, con congrats on fully completing the system of German idealism. Well, uh, you know, we haven't, we haven't done that. Um, the phenomenology isn't the totality of Hegel's system. And there's a lot of discussion and disagreement among Hegel scholars about exactly what is the system, what's the relation between, for example, the phenomenology of spirit and the science of logic, which is the next big book that follows, or the encyclopedia logic or the uh, philosophy of right. And, you know, the general answer is there's lots of answers and nobody really knows, you know, it's, it's something that great philosophers do find perplexing. Uh, some people like to get really schematic with it and draw the correspondences between the works, but that's all very speculative. Um, so, you know, and, and I know that we, we treat this uh, uh, completion of the system of German idealism as kind of a joke these days, but it was, it was kind of a big issue for people back then, I guess. And I don't see that it's all that important now, in part because, you know, if we're taking Hegel as a guide, obviously history didn't end. There's lots of stuff that he's left out. Um, he's got a very uh, Eurocentric perspective when it comes to world history. Um, anyway, we could go on and on with that. All right. So more congratulations, Mark. Thanks, Mark. Uh, glad you're, you're here. Uh, Joseph says, I'm planning on starting the whole series next year, one a day. Oh, that's, a, that's a cool idea. There's, there's more than 365, but, I mean, that would get you very close to the end of it. I suppose if you really wanted to get it done in a year, you could double up or something, you know. Um, ben Jammin, the goatee, gets a lot grayer as it goes on. Well, fortunately not gray, but white, you know. Um, I, I haven't, I don't have a lot of gray hairs. I have been, at least according to my wife, uh, lucky in that things are going more white than anything else, including, you know, eventually the mustache should be all the way there. I have a friend, by the way, over in Belgium, who's about my age and has exactly the opposite thing. He has a big beard, which is still brown, but his hair on top is completely white. <laughs> He's sort of like my mirror image. All right. Uh, Kiben, the fide fidelity and production value of the videos doesn't detract from all the information you provide in it. I mean, yeah, that's the good thing. You know, it, you can hear what's being said. You can look at the chalkboard and see what's, what's on it. Um, and, you, you know, you can follow along with the text. And I think people can get quite a bit out of it. Occasionally, I misspell words on the chalkboard. You know, I'm not the best speller, um, but that shouldn't like, that's not a critical issue, right? Um, now, here's an interesting thing, and I can't read Cyrillic, so I, I, I don't know how to pronounce this person's name, but Professor, you're one awesome Hegelian. So that's the interesting thing. I'm not a Hegelian. Um, I enjoy Hegel. Um, I think that he's very valuable to study and, and think about, but I'm not, I'm not a Hegelian. Um, I'm an eclectic. I draw upon a number of different philosophical points of view, much the way that Cicero does. So we describe this as Ciceronian eclecticism and try to wield them together, you know, as far as they can be integrated into something like a, a well-thought-out synthesis. But And you might say, well, why, why would you do a, a series like this if you're not a Hegelian? Because I'm not, uh, I'm not a team person, right? I'm not, 
I do a lot of work with modern stoicism. I'm not on team stoicism, you know, thinking that that's like the only thing that matters or, you know, they got everything completely right. I, I don't have that, that sort of point of view about Hegel either. Um, I think he's great, but I think that there's a lot of things that he got wrong, even in his own time, but that's okay. I think that about Hobbes and Descartes and Hume and other people who I teach as well. All right. Uh, Evan says, congratulations. I don't know of any other YouTube channel that makes philosophy so accessible without sacrificing the depth and breadth of the subject matter. All the best to you. I mean, I know of a few. Um, fortunately, there's others out there, um, but they're doing different things than I do, right? So there's, there's good lectures out there. Uh, Gavin says, why did you decide to use the Miller translation for the series? Would you use it again if you were to go back? Well, because the Miller translation was the most up-to-date translation in 2014. Um, Pinkard was working on his translation, and you could get drafts online, but his translation didn't actually come out until the last few years, along with two other recent translations as well. And there wasn't any point in switching halfway through. The Miller translation is still widely used. Um, I think that it'll be around for quite a while. I mean, there are some problems with it. I will say that Pinkard's translation is definitely superior to Miller's translation in a number of respects, including fidelity to the actual German text. But Miller is not awful you know like some translations you read and you're like what in the hell is this i don't remember them saying anything remotely like this for example there's some some there's a lot of translations of marcus aurelius out there that i read through and i'm you know and people like do quotes of and i'm like that ain't what he's saying at all that doesn't sound like like marcus and then i go to the greek and i see that they they've really botched it up um Miller's, you know, Miller's decent, right? And as somebody who's translated myself in Latin and French, to a lesser extent, Greek and German, I have learned to be not only humble myself as a translator, but forgiving of other people's translation mistakes or choices, because it's tough um, when you're doing translation projects. I haven't done one for quite a while, but I, I have uh, some on the back burner that I want to get to eventually. So, all right. Um, let's see here. Just skipped a little bit. Um, let me see if I can scroll back. There's a lot of comments here. So, um, Anthony says, it's quite a feat. The series has been a good investment in my continuous learning and philosophy. That's that's awesome. Uh, philosophical community, the White Tower. Until now, we've been reading Hegel mostly from Greek books. Now we're very lucky to watch this magnificent video series being produced by a magnanimous personality like you. Oh, thanks very much. That's, that's nice to say. Um, Alex says, I'm in Germany by chance with my copy of Hegel. I'll keep up the study. That's awesome. Snoopy, is there any secondary literature on Hegel you'd recommend? Any good scholars, thoughts on Taylor's Hegel and Hegel in modern society? You know, I, I'm Taylor is somebody who I've never like really gotten into that that much. Um, there's something about the way he writes that for me, I, I, I just find it hard to like get into him. I, I did a whole video on self-directed study of, of Hegel that you can easily Google. There's like uh, secondary text that I recommend in there. So you might check that out. Um, George McClay says, it's good to hear how you managed to derive the actual meaning Hegel or other philosophers originally meant. Does the uh, interpretation change over time or is there an objective interpretation? I'd get rid of that word objective because it's not useful there. Um, Interpretations do change over time of different philosophers. Some interpretations are crap, you know. Some are great. Um, we don't we don't require everybody to have like the one objective consensus interpretation. You're never going to find that. 
anybody who tries to sell you on that is probably lying to you. And uh, you would pro you would do well to, um, you know, avoid th those sorts of framings of stuff. Uh, Massa Massa Milano says, what do you think of Alexander Kojev's impact on how we think of contemporarily about Hegelian philosophy, specifically Ari, the master slave dialectic? I don't think that too many people who talk about Hegel and the master-slave dialectic actually read Kojev these days. Um, Kojev is an interesting author. I do um, like his introduction to the reading of Hegel, and he's got other books that are worth checking out as well. You may not know this, but Kojev, you know, he actually became an EU uh, administrator because he thought that this was like the development of the dialectic in, in real time uh, after World War II. So, you know, I think he's he's uh, interesting, but sort of like when you read Heidegger and Deleuze, you're getting more of them than you are the original thinker. His contemporary, who would be much more faithful to Hegel, would be, of course, you know, Hippolyte, right? Um, and I would say that Hippolyte and Kojève have been about equally influential in mid-century to up until like the 80s and 90s Hegel scholarship. Um I think that the master-slave dialectic gets made far too much of, and I'll just say two things about that. So here is the book. And see this little portion here? That's the master-slave dialectic. Here's the stuff that came before it. Here's the stuff that came after it. So clearly the master-slave dialectic is not the most important part of the work. It's actually just a tiny little bit of the self-consciousness section. And nobody should make such a big deal out of it as they do. Uh, but I think they find it, you know, fascinating and sexy and topical and all that. And then they totally ignore, here's the second thing, the fact that the recognition that we're looking for doesn't happen through the master-slave uh, uh, dialectic, right, or the relations in it but through the development, the long, complex development of culture after that. So, you know, I may someday do a, a, another, I, I've done, you know, seminars on the master-slave dialectic. I may do that again in the future. Uh, Joseph Ags, what philosopher do you find most helpful for dealing with mental struggles? There isn't a philosopher that I find most useful for that. Um, Guy, thank you for making me understand Hegel. You saved my life and time with your incredible lectures. Oh, thank you very much. Uh, that's, that's, that's nice. Um, all right. So Corey says your only team is the Green Bay Packers. That's not even true in NFL football. I am not just a Packers fan. I'm also a Chicago Bears fan. I grew up in a family where we watched both games and had glassware and, you know, various other stuff from both of those uh, teams, rival teams. So, you know, that's kind of unusual. I'm also a Colts fan uh, from living in Indiana and having family down there for quite a while. Um, all right, let's see. Ludus, uh, what do you think about the way Hegel's used by Marx and in Marxism more broadly? I think Marxism is a hot mess of people reinterpreting Marx in a lot of different ways, arguing with each other, excommunicating each other. That's a huge topic. Um, and I think that, um, you know, Marx has sort of a reductive and, and polemical attitude towards Hegel, but Marx is doing his own thing too, right? Um, New Atlanteism, what do you think Hegel got wrong? I, I'm, I mean, I could do a whole video about that, but I think that one of the biggest things is obviously history didn't end with the sort of closure that he thought it had. And so there's important aspects of the development of human consciousness that have been left behind. I also think he's a little bit too unitary, too singular in the way that the complex dialectic goes. There's a lot of things that have been left out of the process, um, in part because Hegel himself has a, a lot of presuppositions, even though he denies having them about that. Brooklyn, do you like Michael Sugre? I don't really watch other people much on YouTube because who's got the time? Uh, he seems a competent person, but I don't watch his, his videos, you know. Um, 
All right. Uh, do, do, do. Let's see. Sam Prentice, I've heard a lot of criticism of Pinkard as a Hegel scholar, but it's interesting to hear you say it's outright superior. You're blurring two different things together, clearly. Um, one of them is being a scholar, which is writing other things about that person. And uh, another is being a translator. You can be a great translator without being a great scholar. You can be a great scholar without being a great translator. You can be both at the same time. And here's what you, you want to keep in mind. You pick any Hegel scholar and you are going to find people saying bad things about them. There's no like, there's no like ranking or best, you know, best 10 scholars. That, that, that sort of thing doesn't exist, right? Uh, once you start getting to the level of somebody like Pinkard, you're in a select few of people who are pretty damn good at what they do. And uh, you can disagree with them. You can say that they've taken the wrong approach. But, you know, I would be hesitant to um, go toe-to-toe -to -toe with, with him on Hegel interpretation, right? Um, all right. Uh, Guy, what's your opinion on Stephen Holgate? I don't really have an opinion on Stephen Holgate, you know. Um, Philosophical community, what can we say about Hegel and Plato as political theorists based on their political aspirations? Uh, they're very different from each other. There's, there's something you can say. Um, Jabro, what are you reading at the moment? Well, I am finishing up uh, the second book in N.K. Jemison's Broken Earth series, The Obelisk Gate, because I'm doing that next month. I'm reading actually rereading a lot of stuff from my classes and uh, getting ready for Stoicon. So I'm going through Stoic texts, looking for examples that I want to discuss of beautiful things, you know. All right. Um, Proem, thanks for all your work. It's been valuable. I hope you take some time to rest and enjoy yourself if you can. Unfortunately, I can't. I've got four classes this semester going. I have a full load of clients that I'm working with. I have lots of other things. And, you know, I do my volunteering at the cat shelter. I've got a family life, so I'm, I'm still pretty busy. Maybe around Christmas time, I can take a break. All right. Um, let me see. John Garrell, speaking of interpretation, are you into hermeneutics like Dilte and Gadamer? Gadamer, yes. Dilte, no. Heidegger, yes. Arendt, yes. Ricoeur, yes. Dilte, no. So, sure, I'm, I'm into hermeneutics. Um, Sam Prentice, I've heard people who do philosophy in French. The English translation of him, don't know who him is, is not very good, so can't be sure about that. Oh, talking about Kojev. Yeah, it could be. Uh, I don't know. Um, We'd have to take a look at the, the text and, and see what it looks like. Um, the internet, do you think there's any truth in what many Hegelians, such as Rorty, Rorty is not a Hegelian, claim that most philosophy after Hegel tries very hard to get out of his embrace, but always seems to somehow go back to him? No, I, I don't. I don't. I mean, I think that some people wind up going back into Hegel, but that's often because he's part of the conversation. But it's not like everybody, it's not like you, you know, we used to joke around. If you try to get out of the dialectic, you've, Hegel's already anticipated that. Well, that's not actually true. So, all right. Uh, let's see. Okay. So, so now it's a good time to address some of the other things that people are asking about. Oh, here's here's a good one. Joao, are all Hegel's videos going to be continue to be available for the public? That's what putting them into YouTube means, right? They're they're public, they're out there. Why would I take them down? You know? Um, so people are um, asking about would you do this one? Would you do this one? So um, I'm not going to do Kant's critique of pure reason because you know I'm not as interested in Kant. And if I was going to do any Kant, it sure as hell wouldn't be the first critique, which I find much less interesting than the second critique and the third critique. Um, 
And I think there's plenty of people out there already doing great work on, on Kant's first critique. I will be doing, however, uh, a series of core concept videos that I hope to start shooting tonight on Kant's prolegomena to any future metaphysics, which is, you know, an introduction to the, the critique. But I'm not doing the half hour Hegel series approach to that. Uh, I'm not going to do it with Spinoza either because I don't, you know, if, frankly, I don't find him as interesting as I do many other philosophers. I, I get that a lot of people are into him, but, you know, having studied him for decades and taught him and, you know, taken exams on him, I just, I don't find him that interesting. I will be doing something on one of his predecessors, though. Um Maurice Blondel, you know, Max Montague, how would you feel about the possibility of making half-hour Maurice Blondel videos on action? I mean, I think I'd probably do some core concept videos rather than an entire series. Uh, Blondel is great, but he's rather obscure. And, you know, these videos take time for me to do, time that I could be spending uh, making a living doing other things. So unless there's, like, significant support for it, um, Probably it's not going to, you know, it's not on the horizon, but I, I do plan to do some core concept videos probably in the coming year on Maurice Blondel. Um, people want to know about the logic and by the logic, we mean the science of logic, which is much more interesting, I think, than the encyclopedia logic. And, you know, people have always been saying, oh, you have to do the science of logic after this. No, I don't. I can do whatever texts I want to, you know. Um, and science of logic is a pretty cool work, and you know, it's it's well worth somebody doing some work on it. But you know, there's already a video series, an extensive video series out there on the science of logic, which you can find on the um, British Hegel Society YouTube. You just gotta like Google it, and I don't see any reason to replicate that. By the way, there's also lectures out there on Kant's critique of pure reason. You know, uh, Robert Wolf did a whole wonderful series on, on that, you know. So there's no reason for me to reinvent wheels that other people are already doing. And, you know, here's another one. Uh, Aquinas' eternal exploration, Summa Theologia. I thought about doing the summa. I mean, I probably, it's, it's such a long work. I'd probably be doing it the rest of my life. And I'm already doing core concept videos on the summa theologia on selected parts. You know, I just released a set on the five ways. So I've got stuff on some of the stuff in prima pars and some of the stuff in uh, the prima secundae. Um, and, you know, I, I think there's other people that there's so many people out there doing Thomas Aquinas that maybe I don't need to do that, you know, in, in terms of the half hour Hegel series. So what are my actual plans? I've already done another series like the half hour Hegel series. You may or may not know about it. I did it. Well, how many years ago? At least five years ago. Epictetus is Enchiridion. Uh, half hour treatment, line by line, looking at the Greek, you know, I actually created an entire online class, which you can find in the study with Sadler Academy uh, doing that. But I, I, I've decided that the next two texts I'm going to do are shorter texts and texts that I think really would benefit from this. One is on the person who I've published the most on in my career, and that's St. Anselm. So I'm going to be going through the Proslogian line by line, paragraph by paragraph, in the way that I've done with this half-hour Hegel series. Um, I'm using uh, Thomas Williams' translation for that, which is good. Um, and then, you know, going back to the, the Latin, of course, uh, which I've got, you know, uh, Schmidt and Southern, no, Schmitz, just Schmidt, uh, his, his edition of. And then after that, it's going to be Rene Descartes' Meditations on First Philosophy. Um, that's a work that I think would definitely benefit from this. And there I'll be looking at, you know, an English translation from sort of the standard version that we use, uh, and then looking at the, the French and Descartes' own Latin 
you may not know this, but Descartes wrote the meditations in Latin and then had it translated into French for him, right? So um, then after that, I, I'm willing to take on a big book, like, you know, a big, thick book like The Phenomenology. And the one that I'm leaning to the most right now is actually Sartre's Being and Nothingness because it's it's a great book. It's one that I cut my teeth on. It's probably the first big philosophy book that I read when I was an undergraduate, and I, I really enjoyed it. And I think that Sartre, you know, is a, is a good writer, um, interesting, and it would benefit from having, you know, that sort of attentiveness uh, paid to it. But I, I don't know. I'm, I've kicked around some other ideas, talked about this with some some close friends from time to time. And um, yeah, that would, that would be quite interesting to, to do. Um, all right. So I think I've got to scroll back up here. Um, the manual says thoughts on Adorno's negative dialectics. If you're familiar with it, my first publication was actually on Adorno's negative dialectics. Uh, it's in an online journal called Minerva. So, you know, I think Adorno's in it, a really interesting guy. I find it difficult to write on him in part because there's so much going on in his works. And if you read Adorno, not in, in English translation, but like in the original German, you really need five different languages, uh, German, French, English, Latin, Greek, to be able to make out what, what he's saying. I, I realized that when I started uh, working on minima moralia for a, uh, a class that I was I was taking at one time, reading it in the, the original. Um, Barbara, what made you pursue a PhD in philosophy? Did you already intend on becoming a professor at the time? I heard doctor titles in humanity are a risky step. Um, so this is back in the 90s, you know. I finished my undergraduate. I majored in philosophy and mathematics. And um, I took a year off, worked here in Milwaukee, where I'm living now, back here in, in my uh, home town, so to speak, and uh, started applying to graduate schools. I had zero guidance from any of my undergraduate professors. Um, didn't realize that with my scores, I pretty much could have gone anywhere I wanted to. But, you know, like a lot of first generation college students, I, I didn't know how the game was played. And so I applied to about 10 different schools. Uh, Marquette, right down the road where I teach uh, from time to time, immediately lost my letters of recommendation. Uh, didn't bother to tell me until I was out of the process. So they, they, that was one off the, the books right there. Of the other places I applied to, all of them accepted me, um, but only three of them offered me fellowships. And a fellowship is where you're essentially paid to, to do things. And so I had St. Louis University, Fordham University, and Southern Illinois University at Carbondale. St. Louis and Fordham each got to me with an offer that was lower than, Saint, than uh, Southern Illinois University at Carbondale. Um, and so I went there. And I started out um, in the master's program. And then after I finished my master's, I was like, well, yeah, may as well go on and do the PhD. There wasn't a lot of thought put into it. I enjoyed studying. Um, I was already used to living poor. So, you know, living on a, a stipend that allowed me to buy books and have some, you know, beer and cook for myself and live in a, a little trailer um, with eventually my, my cats and stuff was A-OK -okay by me. Um, did I think I would teach philosophy? I thought there was a chance I would do that, but, I, you know, Hiring back then was the, the job market back then was crap. It's worse now, but it was it was pretty bad in the early 2000s, you know. Um, and I, I, you know, I ended up doing a different thing. I my mom died. I had an inheritance. I moved my family onto my family's land in Indiana and applied for jobs around there, and uh, wound up working in a maximum security prison for six years. So, all right. Um, Let's see here. Joseph, I have to stop and recognize you do, the, that you're 
recognize that your undertaking in this project is amazing. Oh, thanks. Yeah, I mean, it's taken a lot of work and a lot of time. And I think if I knew exactly how much work it would be, um, maybe I wouldn't have committed to it the way I did. But fortunately, I did. And it all worked out in the end, you know. Um, Snoopy, what do you feel are the most interesting developments in contemporary philosophy happening now? I mean, to me, the most interesting stuff is good history of philosophy that connects it up with the way that we live in the present. I'm not so interested in contemporary analytic philosophy and actually not all that interested in contemporary continental philosophy because I find a lot of it is a waste of my time, you know. Um, a lot of, again, reinventing of wheels in part because people don't read enough before they start, you know, um, getting into their, their own things. And you can't say that about history of philosophy so much. Um, Boychev, what do you think of the kind of analytic Hegelianism that has gained traction thanks to scholars such as Pippin and Brandom? So Brandom is an interesting guy. He starts out as an analytic, but I'd say he's actually more of a historian of philosophy at this point. Um, and that's because he, he's attentive to the text. I would say that the analytic, so this applies to analytic Nietzscheanism, Thomism, Hegelianism, pick whatever you want. It's usually garbage because they don't read enough texts. They don't pay a close enough attention to uh, systematic thinkers. And they want to they wanted basically mine them for stuff that they can incorporate into their own approach. But they're, and I'm not going to say this about Pippin and Brandom. I'm going to say this about a lot of analytic uh, uh, people doing, you know, historical figures, they're lazy. They don't actually want to read an awful lot. And that's a problem because you're not going to understand, you're not even going to understand Descartes without reading his corpus, right? So uh, Matt Sherman, why do you find Kant's other critiques more interesting than his first? Because more interesting stuff is happening there. I mean, the epistemology, oh, the Copernican turn, oh, wow, so important. Yeah, okay, sure. But not that important because we can see that there's lots of ways to go that don't take you through Kant. He's not the, you know, um, gatekeeper that he presents himself as being that some people make him into. And I find moral philosophy and, and the stuff that's going on in the, in the third critique, which is a weird, wacky ride, more interesting than Kant's, you know, uh, kind of forced epistemology and, you know, kind of, kind of boring metaphysics. Um, I think where Kant is most interesting in the critique is where he's talking about other philosophers. The first critique, uh, the second critique is just amazing. It's much shorter, and if you pair it together with the groundwork and the the two parts of the metaphysics of morals and uh, religion within the limits of reason alone, which is essentially an ethics book, you get this really interesting. Uh, understanding not just of ethics, but you get a philosophical anthropology out of it as well that has to do with freedom. So, yeah. All right. So more congratulations. Um, ground floor, Guthrie is Kant, the first European philosopher to seriously examine Eastern thinkers. As far as I know, Kant doesn't actually examine Eastern thinkers. You might be thinking of Schopenhauer, who is coming after Kant, who's very engaged with them. Um, but no, Montesquieu has his Persian letters, you know, there, there's engagements with, with non-Western thought happening uh, in the 18th century. Um, so, you know, Kant is not the, the first. Um, George McLean, it, it'd be good to give us a flyover of the transition of thought from Kant to Hegel to Heidegger. Yeah, I, that's, that's not a compelling project for me. Maybe somebody else could do that. Uh, Prouk's productions, Blondel's French does seem significantly more complicated than many of his contemporaries. Eh, yeah, sometimes, sometimes not. I mean, I would say that when you read, say, somebody like Merleau-Ponty, his prose is pretty intricate and complex as well. I mean, he's a little bit later, right, than, than Blondel. He also mentions Blondel. But there's, there's other French thinkers. Blondel's work, sort of like Hegel. Blondel is not a great stylist. He tries to pack too much into uh, paragraph-long sentences from time to time. 
Um, his work is often described as turgid, but there's a lot of cool stuff happening in it. And, you know, you just put in the work to figure out what the hell the guy's saying and it's not insurmountable, you know, um, it's just, you know, he's not like a, a wonderful stylist like some of the other people are, but I mean, you could take Blondell and put him up against writers, French writers post-war where French writing took this very precious turn, you know, with the uh, people like, for example, Deleuze and Lacan, you know, um, Derrida especially. And you could be like, well, you know, you can figure out what the hell Derrida is saying, but it takes more work than figuring out what Blondell is saying. Uh, Joseph Ags was German idealism influenced by medieval mysticism. Yeah, sure, to some degree. Um, but these are like, you're talking in terms of huge abstractions. What you really would want to do more is say, is this German idealist influenced by medieval mystics? And if so, by which ones? You know, by say Meister Eckhart, or uh, Jakob Böhme, you know, you, you want to look for who's talking about who or who's invoking uh, which thinkers, right? Um, all right, oops, just skipped a little bit. Villa, is there any, any opinion on uh, Martin Hagland? I don't know who Martin Hagland is, unfortunately. So, Elliot, if you're taking requests, I'm not taking requests. Uh, what about Habermas? Habermas is an interesting guy, and I, I teach his work sometimes. And I think if I was going to uh, do one of his works, I mean, I, I, I the the work of him that I actually like the best is the structural transformation of the public sphere. But that's sort of like a rents um, origins of totalitarianism is a very dense historical work. And I don't know that I would be a good person for, for doing that. But, you know, his, his book on um, that I've used in classes, I'm blanking on the title, like communicative, communicative um, what is it? Something, something action. Uh, I mean, that would be a good one to do. So, but I don't think I would do this series. I think I could do that in terms of uh, core concept videos instead, right? Um, all right, let's see. Kun Ana Poramanka, that's all of it. If you're, if you're talking about the half hour Hegel series, uh, yeah, that's, that's all of it. We've finished the entire book, which is awesome, uh, because now there's about 375, I think, videos out there. Um, going through the text. So like if you're, you know, you're reading and you're like, I can't figure out what the hell paragraph 351 is saying. Well, you can Google Hegel phenomenology 351 and you'll, you'll find the video for it. That'll help you out, you know. Um, let's see. Ludus Van, who else is excited for the Hegel cameo before the Battle of Vienna and the Napoleon movie this year? Is, is there actually a Hegel cameo in there? I, I don't know that there is. Uh, I don't watch a lot of historical movies because they tend to be crap. Um, and I don't, you know, I don't like to waste my time on stuff that's more, more glitz than actual content. And that's what Hollywood, um, ho Hollywood historical movies tend to be. So I don't know. Uh, Massa Milano, any thoughts on non-philosophy, La Rule? Haven't read them, and or the so-called speculative realism movement. I think we're going to look back on the speculative realism movement and say, well, that was a cool fad. Um, didn't really, you know, where it was doing something interesting. A lot of times it was kind of like rehashing older stuff. Um, I, I don't think there was a lot of uh, ballast, so to speak, in that that ship. And that's fine. There's lots of philosophical movements like that. When you know the history of philosophy, you see people that are like, this is the next big thing. And 10 years later, everyone's like, what was that again? I forgot about that. And maybe sometimes it'll come back, but I just haven't found the stuff that I've, you know, I, admittedly, I haven't like gone deep into their texts, but I've met Graham Harmon, you know, and wasn't super impressed. Um, 
So, I, you know, it's one of those things I'm probably not going to spend much more time on because I got other stuff to do. Um, Alfonso says, I recently discovered half our Hegel videos. I already watched three episodes. My God, Hegel is really different from anything I've seen. Yeah, I mean, the common reaction to opening up the, the, um, the preface is like, what in the hell is this? You know, um, so that's it, it's quite understandable. That was one of my motives for doing the, the video series. Right? Uh, and that's, and that's totally understandable. Um, all right. A lot of people writing Hegel, Hegel, Hegel. Um, Barbara says, is the philosophy of consciousness that is panpsychism something that interests you? Philosophy of consciousness is very interesting to me. I mean, that's this, right? Uh, panpsychism, not very interesting to me. And there is much more discussion of consciousness than just by panpsychists. Um, so, sure. I mean, we're all conscious, right? And we're all involved in that. And uh, people have, you know, philosophers have been thinking about that as well as other sciences that came out of philosophy, like psychology, for millennia. Um, Andy says, do you have a current favorite Eastern thinker? I try to avoid Eastern as a designation. I'd rather talk about like the East Asian cultural sphere, which is different than the South Asian cultural sphere, which is different than the uh, Islamic cultural sphere, and all of them eventually interpenetrate each other and contribute to each other as well as to, to the West. Um, do I have a favorite thinker? I wouldn't say so. I mean, I don't have a favorite Western thinker, so any more than I actually have a favorite band. Um, so... No, I mean, I, I will say this, too, that I, you know, occasionally teach some non-Western thinkers, but, and a lot of people, like, make requests or sometimes demands that I should, I should be much more, you know, global and stuff like that. And my answer is, well, you know, I can read um, five languages. One I was born into, and the other I was kind of half-assed born into. That's French because uh, my mother's family is French-Canadian. Um, so I can read, you know, French, English, German, uh, ancient Greek, and uh, Latin. Um, but I don't read classical Chinese. You know, I've made some efforts to learn uh, Mandarin, but never got very far. I don't read any of the South Asian, you know, uh, languages like Sanskrit or Pali or, you know, those sorts of things. So... I'm, I'm more leery of doing content on uh, stuff where I don't, I, I don't have any prospects for checking the translations. And you can say, well, why do you do stuff on Dostoevsky and Kierkegaard then? It's a little bit closer and I can be reasonably confident of the translations. And I try not to make much, you know, rest on the translations. So, yeah. All right, Anthony Summers with more subscribers or Patreon supporters would releasing a PDF with the initial points that you put on the board be something to assist the learning, not something to replace the video. You know, I, I considered that, but I think after almost a decade, it's time for the half hour Hegel project to come to a close. Um, I've thought about, you know, putting together, going through the videos and like, you know, seeing what I actually put on the chalkboard and turning that into, like um, like you said, PDFs. Um, that's a possibility maybe down the line. Um, but, I mean, you know, there'd have to be some support for it because that takes a good bit of time. Um, and I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to, consolidate all my Patreon into just the one big Patreon account. And um, I got to go through and like, you know, make the page look better and do, do a lot of tidying up anyway and reorganizing with my online presence. So yeah, that, that may happen. Uh, Will says, thank you for helping people think. Yeah, that's cool. Uh, Ken says, it'd be fascinating to see a deeper dive into some Russian philosophers such as Shestov and Plekhanov. 
Chef stuff, I definitely want to do more, right? Um, I've only done much work on um, one of his, his quite early books. I think that Athens and Jerusalem would be ripe for, and that's like his, his more or less latest work. Oh, by the way, also a contribution to the 1930s Christian philosophy debates. It was originally published in parts in the Revue de Metaphysique et Morale, and then put into a, a book. And it's probably his most popular book. Um, so I've done stuff on all things are possible, and I need to do some more on that, some more con core concept videos. Um, he's got a really cool book on Dostoevsky and Nietzsche that's a little bit earlier. Shestov, by the way, along with the Danish uh, literary critic Georg Brandes, is one of the first people to see these interconnections between Nietzsche, Dostoevsky. Uh, now, Shestov doesn't realize Kierkegaard, but he, he finds that later on. Tolstoy and Chekhov, um, and you know, to be able to notice those those sort of connections, I think is really cool. So, uh, all right, let's see. It just skipped a little bit. Um, oh, here's an interesting question. ACRB, any opinions on the relatively recent Carnap resurgence or Carnap's work generally? Yeah, I was so I was really surprised by that. Right that people are now into Carnap. But I mean, we see this happen. For a long time, like nobody was reading Bergson other than, you know, people like Deleuze. And now there's like lots of interest in, in Bergson. And you're like, where did this come from? Or Schopenhauer, another great example. When I was in graduate school, the attitude of a lot of the professors is, well, you read Schopenhauer so you can understand Nietzsche better. He's basically just a footnote to Nietzsche. Not really worth reading in his own right. And there were people toiling away, doing work on Schopenhauer, like Wolfgang Schurmacher, who later on down the line, I got to take a, a graduate level class with at European graduate school when I was a visiting scholar there. And, uh, you know, like 10 years ago, people started asking, when are you going to do videos on Schopenhauer? I'm interested in Schopenhauer. And I was like, really? How'd that happen? So with Carnap, yeah, you're like, holy crap, how did people get interested in this guy again? And I think it's cool that people are because he's, he's an interesting guy, right? Um, Tayakovsky, will this be uploaded later? It's being uploaded right now. There's a YouTube live. And so, you know, this is a, uh, a video that you can see on my channel. You just got to go to the live section. Uh Appen Jafar, legendary moment. I love the series. Very ambitious project. So cool it's complete. Yeah, it is. It's great that it's complete. Um, I had some worries at, at some point, you know, whether I would actually manage to, to get it done and how long was it going to take me. Um, but, you know, you just keep plugging away at it and eventually, you know, you get to the end of, of a book. I guess I'm lucky I didn't put, pick a book that's even longer than The Phenomenology of Spirit. Um, but it's it's pretty long as it is. All right, Saxophone Snowman, I followed your series while reading Hegel in Danish. That's, that's interesting. That's got to be uh, quite a translation. So, yeah. Um, by the way, that, that guy that I mentioned just a little bit ago, Georg Brandes, Danish, um, really interesting thinker. He is the one who turned Nietzsche on to Dostoevsky. He wrote Nietzsche and he's like, this guy, you know, you should check him out. And Nietzsche read what's actually my favorite work by Dostoevsky, which is translated either as The Demons or The uh, Possessed. Really great work. Um Peaches, what is a German idealist pickup line? Hegel, can I, can't I get your number? Um, yeah, I, I don't know. Uh, we could do all sorts of wordplay, I suppose, you know, on Fichte, make it into like fitting or fit. And what would we do with Schelling or Schopenhauer? Um, I, I don't really know. It's a good question. Um, Let's see. Any thoughts on sellers? 
no, not really. I don't, I don't spend time reading uh, sellers. Uh, Zeitgeist do some videos on Sun Tzu. I mean, why would I? I just told you exactly why I don't do videos on, on Chinese philosophy. Uh, and if I was going to do it, why would I do it on Sun Tzu rather than, you know, Confucius or um, the Tao Te Ching or Zhuangzi or somebody who's, you know, more in the area of philosophy? Jack, have you read much Derrida? I almost wrote my dissertation on Derrida. Um, and I've actually published on Derrida. So, yeah, I've, I've read a bit of him. Um, Barbara, you mentioned you're more inclined towards non-contemporary philosophers. Is there any current philosopher you fancy who's reading you could recommend? Well, there's many of them. Alistair McIntyre, right, who I've actually studied with. He's, he's still alive. A lot of these great historians like Julia Annas and uh, Margaret Graver and Christopher Gill, who's a friend and colleague of mine, John Sellers, who's a younger friend and colleague of mine, closer to my own age. Uh, Anthony Long, um, you know, lots and lots of people in the um, doing great work in philosophy as a way of life and the history of philosophy, or as McIntyre puts it, tradition guided inquiry. Robert Audi is still alive and out there and still contributing to the field. You know, I just did some videos. Actually, I'm still in the process of releasing videos on, on him. So, yeah, there's tons of people who are contemporary who I find interesting. And you should understand that contemporary philosophy, when we say contemporary, that goes all the way back to like the 1950s. Um, so, you know, when I'm teaching at, at Marquette and I'm teaching uh, my, my foundations class, it's supposed to have a contemporary philosopher in it. I count Simone de Beauvoir as my contemporary philosopher for that. So, um, Alfonso, thoughts on Marxism? How do you see Hegelian dialectics on historical materialism? I think that Hegeli Hegelian dialectics, the real stuff that you actually find in this, is very different than the thesis, antithesis, synthesis um, weirdness that, that people work with. And the Marxists seem to be mostly into that rather than actually drawing on Hegel's dialectics. Uh, and that's fine because dialectics is an equivocal term. Plato has dialectics. Aristotle has dialectics. The Stoics had dialectics. You know, it doesn't always mean exactly the same thing. Thoughts about Marxism, like I said a little bit earlier, the Marxists are kind of a hot mess. They're not really a community. There's probably nothing a Marxist hates more than a fellow Marxist that has a slightly different point of view than them on Marx or Hegel or pick, pick whatever interpreter of Marx that you want. So... Now, that said, I think that there are some contributions that Marx has made. Um, I just don't, I don't, you know, appropriate him as a systematic thinker who has the answers to everything. Uh, you should also remember, too, that Marx was sort of like George Washington, very, very, very good at getting rivals put out of commission, you know, rivals who he should have probably collaborated with, so... Uh, Jay Lynch, I'm a current philosophy undergrad. Just want to say your videos are fantastic. Thank you so much for your hard work. Oh, you're, you're very welcome. I'm glad that they've been helpful for you. Um, Zeitgeist, Hegel and Schopenhauer should have collapsed. Well, they kind of did. Uh, at least Hegel. Hegel helped to get Schopenhauer, if I remember the story right, his, his job. And then Schopenhauer returned the favor by trying to schedule... Uh, his classes at the same time as Hegel's, finding that, you know, nobody really wanted to go to his classes. That meant a significant reduction in his income. And he says all sorts of nasty things about Hegel. Uh, it's clear that Schopenhauer couldn't have collaborated with Hegel. Um, and, you know, given the shitty things that, that Schopenhauer said about Hegel, I don't know why Hegel would have wanted co to collaborate with him. Um Jordan, what do you think about the introduction to the phenomenology, like finding the criteria of philosophy of consciousness in terms of consciousness? I think the introduction is a lot easier to read than the preface, right? And I think I may have mentioned that at the very beginning of the uh, set of videos on the introduction. I mean, Hegel's, you know, the, the, the preface is this, all this stuff all kind of jumbled together it's almost like listening to somebody do free association with things that they're really into and have thought about for a long time. The introduction is a bit more straightforward. 
and thinking about the issues of where are we in philosophy now and how do we avoid skepticism and how do we incorporate uh, things. Um, all right. Uh, just skipped a bit here. Uh, Josh, did the French 1930s Christian debate, Christian philosophy debates, you mean, impact Vatican II at all? Um, indirectly, I mean, Maurice Blondel has been called by Xavier Ryan, the philosopher of Vatican II. He's also the philosopher of John Paul II's Fides et Ratio, as Fiacre Long has, has argued, I think, quite successfully in an article on it. Um, he's not mentioned in Fides et Ratio, and the reason is because the entire document is Blondelian in its uh, approach. By the way, Carol Votia, who becomes John Paul II, knew Blondel quite well because he writes about him in his great work, The Acting Person. So, you know, thinkers who were involved in those Christian philosophy debates play a role in, in Vatican II. Their thought influences other people. So, yeah, there's, there's uh, some impact, you could say. Uh, Chase, working through the phenomenology for the first time, your lessons are an indis indispensable achievement. I'm, I'm glad uh, that, that's, that's helpful. Uh, Sacrifice Zone, a podcast. Do you have any favorite fiction with philosophical content? Samuel Delaney has a short story when an old woman tries to explain dialectics to one of the village children. Well, you are if you don't know about it, you are in for a treat. I have an entire series called Worlds of Speculative Fiction where I look at world building and philosophical themes we are now in, what, year eight of the series? It was a monthly series that I was doing at a local library, and I've been doing it online. We just did Thomas Ligotti. Um, so there's 73 different episodes that you can watch if you'd like to. They're all at least an hour and 20 minutes long. Um, I've also done a lot of core concepts on philosophical fiction, including... Um, Fyodor Dostoevsky, um, some other thinkers as well. I've got an entire series called Speculative Fiction Studies where I've you know, looked at uh, Ursula K. Le Guin, gone through the entire Earthsea uh, saga, um, a bit of Philip Jose Farmer, two Philip K. Dick books, uh, Man in the High Castle, which I think I did 19 videos on, and... Um, Oh, uh, do androids dream of electric sheep? So yeah, I've 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 done some, uh, I've got some favorite fiction with philosophical content. Uh, Quay scenes keep plugging away at it. Me in fifty years when I'm halfway through the book, yeah, I won't take you that long. Just just keep reading and you'll you'll do okay with it. Uh, Jamie, what are your thoughts on Zizek's reading of Hegel? I basically ignore Zizek at this point. He was he was quite rigorous and interesting in his early work. Uh, I encountered him first in the 1990s. I saw his work become progressively more and more, let's just say, speculative and, and uh, less about, you know, rigorous uh, backing up of claims and more like free association. I don't, I don't really take him that seriously at this point in time. So, and so Zeitgeist, a half hour Zizek would be so fire. Ain't going to happen for me because I'm not interested in Zizek really. Uh, Kinnera, do you agree with Todd McGowan's notion Hegel can be read as a proto-psychoanalytic theorist stuck using German idealist vocabulary? Can, sure. You can read him however you want to. Should? I mean, that's not the reading I would pick, but, you know, McGowan, like so many other interpreters, has got his shtick, and he's going to stick with it and elaborate it and do whatever he can with it, but I don't find that particularly... Uh, interesting or attractive, right? Um, let's see here. Now you see, I think your series might be the longest non-gaming series on YouTube. Maybe. I, I don't know. I mean, there's probably longer series out there that we just haven't, like, come across. Uh, Jordan, what do you think of the, what do you first think of the force and understanding when you first read through it? Oh, the first time I read through it, I, I, I actually was reading it in German because I had this, uh, uh, second edition of the phenomenology that I found in our university library. And, you know, 
forcing the understanding is a hell of a lot more difficult than the two preceding sections. And I was like, what in the hell? You know, like I said. Um, and then, you know, we talked about it in class. Uh, my professor was mostly interested in the concept of force, not quite so interested in the, the world stuff going on there. Um, Book Pilled says, uh, Worlds of Speculative Fiction is some of the very best sci-fi fantasy content on YouTube. Oh, thank you. That's, that's very nice. I'm glad that you enjoy it. Uh, Lauren, do you ever plan on covering some Adorno texts? Uh, you know, if I was going to do it, I probably would do, instead of Adorno himself, I'd probably do Adorno and Horkheimer's Dialectic and Enlightenment, which I think is, is pretty readable. Um, but I, I don't know. I, I, it's not a high priority for me. Um, let's see here. Oh, Jordan, do you think that the phenomenology is a necessary stepping point if you want to understand the science of logic? So that's, that's a great question. You know, I would say no. Um, and there's a lot of people, as I mentioned earlier, who want to see a very strong correlation between the phenomenology and the science of logic. It appears that Hegel himself thought that there was, and, you know, it's his own writings, right? But exactly what the correlations are, Hegel scholars don't agree on that. And I think the two works can be read separately and you can get a lot out of it. I, I don't like buy into the Hegelian system or that like you have to understand the entire system or you can't understand any part of it. I think you can take bits and pieces and, and use them outside of their context for productive purposes. Like you could take the section on the syllogisms and uh, get something out of that from the science of logic. That, that's quite interesting. Uh, Bartholomew, when did you first start reading Hegel as an undergrad? No, as an undergrad, uh, Hegel was despised by my two professors. Um, and I didn't read him until I got to graduate school. Unfortunately, by then, I had enough German that I could, you know, use the English and the German text. Actually, I also read Hippolyte's French uh, uh, translation as well, which is really great because there's like all these footnotes and stuff like that. So... Um, Josh, do you agree with McIntyre's conclusion and after virtue we must either return to the Aristotelian discourse concerning morality or embrace Nietzsche's view on the genealogy of morals? That's not what McIntyre actually says. Um, McIntyre himself has, you know, after virtue is one of the four book series. And it's only the first book. You want to also read Whose Justice, Which Rationality, Three Rival Versions, and Dependent Rational Animals to get the fuller picture. And, you know, to answer your question a little facetiously, not even McIntyre thinks that by the time that we get to dependent rational animals. So, um, Matt Sherman, did you find anything specifically valuable in the early, more rigorous Zizek? Yeah, rigorous discussions of what's going on in Lacan, for example. Um, but it's been a long time since I've read that. Um, all right. Prague's productions, the Hegel's ideas have any relationship to the common categories found in Neoplatonic thinkers? And is it worthwhile to see Hegel, especially the philosophy of history in these categories? It is not worth it at all. And uh, the Neoplatonists don't agree on, on you know, what the categories are anyway. They're, the Neoplatonists are not a unified school. Um, they're kind of a loose connection of, of it, really interesting thinkers. But um, there's a lot of different versions of Neoplatonism out there. And uh, I, I would say you want to be kind of careful about saying that there's a, you know, Neoplatonist uh, thing. Um, relativist, what languages do you speak? Uh, basically just French and English. I mean, German I can get by with if I've been in country for a while. It takes me a while now as an older person to get my ear attuned. I'm also a little bit deaf um, due to tinnitus. Is that the way it's pronounced? Um, so that also makes like French a little bit tricky for me or sometimes even when people are speaking English, you know. Uh, French has all sorts of what they tell you are silent letters that aren't actually completely silent. Um, 
So, you know, I mostly use English, but if need be, I can get by with French and, you know, I, I mean, I can do a little bit of Portuguese, but not much. It, it all depends on what I'm using at the time. And obviously I don't speak Latin or Greek, you know. Um, Zachary, have you ever taught graduate philosophy seminars? Would you be interested in teaching grad philosophy seminars at some point? I'd be interested if anybody would actually have me do it, but I've never had the opportunity to, to do that. And um, graduate stuff is easier to teach than undergraduate because they're go-getters. You know, you just get steer them towards the material. You make them do presentations in class. The hardest classes to teach are actually intro to philosophy, ethics, these lower level classes for non-majors. They're the most challenging. And uh, that's where you become a good teacher, teaching those kinds of things. But sure, yeah, if somebody wanted to hire me to teach grad classes, I don't see that happening anytime soon. So, Jordan, do you think that the stoicism, skepticism, and the unhappy consciousness is a refutation of solipsism like Beiser does? I don't know who Beiser is. And that, I mean, I don't think it's a refutation of solipsism. Um, and that's a really weird point of view to take, like totally, almost like totally off topic. It's sort of like going into an art museum and being like, I love these cracks in the floor, you know, and not looking at the art. Um, Lauren says, a little off topic. Do you know about Bernard Suzanne's reading order for Plato? Have you tried the order? Do you find it valuable considering other orderings aren't popular today? I know about it, but I consider it. It, there's no reason why we should take it on um, any more than we have to do the ordering and that we find in um, middle Platonism or later Neoplatonism. You read the text however you want to, you know, and you don't need somebody else bossing you around in the back of your head telling you, this is the way to do it. You know, you will get the most out of it this way. I mean, I didn't read Plato in any sort of order, you know, and uh, hopefully I kind of know what I'm talking about when I'm presenting on him, right? Um, let's see here. That said podcast, have you heard of the work of Joseph Rouse? Never even heard of Joseph Rouse, so no. Uh, but don't take that as, you know, something bad against him because there's literally tens of thousands of authors that I haven't heard of who might be interesting, but you know, we get 24 hours a day, and I spend most of that reading people who I've already read and then occasionally branching out into others. Um, Stan Canner, thoughts on John McDowell's work? Don't have any thoughts on John McDowell's work, really. Um, Lucky RG, are there any interesting connections you can think of between Hegel's ideas, uh, especially in the phenomenology and the early church fathers? No, I don't see any really interesting ideas between them. Um, or connections between them. Um, Alexandra, have you delved into the science of logic? Yeah, I've read the whole science of logic. When I, I mentioned at the beginning, when I did my special thinkers uh, exam on Hegel as a, a PhD student, I had to like study sections and be able to talk about them competently in exams of the science of logic and the entirety of the phenomenology. Um, Bengal Studio, do you think Hegel is relevant to artificial intelligence? Not directly, but in, in some ways, you know, you can adapt some of the things that he's saying about consciousness and, you know, like the difference between representational thinking or philosophy of the understanding, as he calls it later in the, um, uh, lectures on the, his, uh, lectures on the philosophy of religion and conceptual thinking. Artificial intelligence at this point is just a metaphor. It's not actually intelligent. It's parasitic on human intelligence. Um, but, you know, there could be something like that in the future. Um, let's see here. Josh, what do you think of this statement from Foucault on Hegel? We have to determine the extent to which our anti-Hegelianism is one of his tricks. Yeah, I think that's just typical, like, Foucault bullshitting around, basically. Um Bartholomew, have you done a view, video on Plato's Parmenides? You can always find what I've done videos on by just searching, you know. Uh, any Anything I've actually done a video on will come up. I haven't done it, anything on that. Um, do you find a lot of value in that dialogue? I don't find a lot of value in the dialectic portion of it, which is the main 
part, but the criticism of the doctrine forms, you know, pretty important, isn't it? Uh, my analytic professor told me it's jibber jabber. Yeah, okay. I mean, different different folks have different points of view, right? Um, Jordan, do you think that Hegel's being nothing becoming dialectic can be read into Plato's Parmenides? I mean, you can read anything into whatever you want to. It's just whether there's an actual productive, you know, reading that comes out of that. Um, let's see. One, zero, three, two, one, Abel, starting on the Hegel journey with you. Thank you for all of this. I have some minor background in philosophy, but never read Kant. Reading his prolegomena be sufficient to get caught up for Hegel. Can't hurt. I mean, you, you probably also want to read the groundwork if you're going to do that. Um, it's not like Hegel is, you know, a Kantian. Um, he's doing his own thing. Um, you probably would want to read just as much of Aristotle as you would want of, of Kant, I suppose. Um, let's see. Lauren Kyo, is there any lesser known philosophers you think would be worth looking into if I wanted to study dialectics as a general concept? There is no general concept of dialectics. There's a whole bunch of different notions of dialectics. So I don't really have recommendations on that. Um, Oliver, what's your opinion on Kozhev's reading of Hegel? I mentioned that already. Some say he completely misread Hegel. Um, yeah, people say lots of stuff. It doesn't mean that it's actually true or even intelligent. Completely misread Hegel. I mean, how the hell would you completely misread Hegel? I guess turning him into a coffee cup or something. Is that is that what Kozhev did? Uh, nobody completely misreads the, the thinker. Um, Kozhev is doing his own shtick and he's kind of using Hegel for what he, he wants to, you know. Um, Gavin, on the topic of AI, have you experimented with using chat GPT? I've published some pieces on that over, you know, recent months. So yeah, I've experimented with it. Um, relativist, do you agree with Nietzsche about genealogy of morality? Nietzsche wrote the genealogy of morality. Genealogy of morality is not a thing that you can agree with Nietzsche on because it's not a thesis. So uh, I, you, I'm not sure what you're asking. Clay's Philip, thanks for everything you do. Extremely useful. Have you read Heidegger's What is Called Thinking? I've just finished it. Really made me think about the nature of thinking. Yeah, I've read it. It's good. Um, I, I, you know, I usually introduce people to Heidegger by using what is metaphysics. Heidegger has a lot of what is X, Y, Z, right? Stuff that he does. Um, so, yeah, Heidegger's, Heidegger's fun. By the way, Heidegger has a great little book on Hegel. Unfortunately, he only goes up to the self-consciousness section, but Heidegger actually talks about Hegel quite a few times in his works. He thinks of Hegel as a very important metaphysician, uh, transforming the way in which we understand being, right? Um, Roman Weingartner, uh, in light of that previous question about Plato and Hegel being able to work together, what do you think of the, about the productivity of creative readings? I don't know what creative readings are, so I don't know. Um, all right, uh, Jordan, what do you think of Kierkegaard's critiques of Hegel? Are they devastating for his project? Absolutely not. Um, Kierkegaard doesn't have critiques of Hegel. He has criticisms of Hegel. A critique is a, a larger project that you'd be doing. And just as with like Hegel's criticism of uh, Stoicism, you always actually have to go to the thing that's being criticized and see whether the criticism is on point. And sometimes Kierkegaard is, and sometimes he isn't. You know, uh, Hegel gets Stoicism wrong. Um, it could apply to certain people that are like fake Stoics in the present or in his time. Um, but, you know, same thing with like Nietzsche and Beyond Good and Evil. You know, he, uh, he's got that passage early on that everybody reads and then they don't read the other passages where he like says, we Stoics. Um, you know, you have to figure out like what is a, a good criticism and what's kind of off base. A lot of the criticisms that Kierkegaard is making of Hegel, Hegel is really a stand-in for Hegelianism. And the Hegelianism of, of Denmark at the time seemed to be pretty 
you know, pretty low grade philosophy. Um, all right. Um, knowing what you know now, would you fundamentally change anything about the way you taught the early chapters, classes on phenomenology 10 years ago? So I didn't teach and they're not classes. They are commentary videos, right? Um, better understood as sort of like parts of a extended book. Uh, I'm not teaching a class. When I'm teaching a class, there's homework, there's you know, all sorts of other stuff that's involved in that, like, a, you know, a, a, an actual class management system. Um, and, you know, the only thing that I would change is use a better camera and use a lapel mic. Otherwise, no, I'd, I'd stick by that stuff, you know. Um, now, every once in a while, people will be like, hey, you know, in this video from eight years ago, you said X, Y, Z. I'll be like, I mean, I said a lot of stuff. If there's 375 videos, then there is so 150 plus uh, 35, so 185. So, you know, about 187 hours of content. I don't always remember every single thing that I said, right? So, um, Clay's Philip, have you considered doing something on the exegesis of Philip K. Dick? That would be fun. If you've ever read the exegesis, you know it's not a book that you would do uh, some sort of videos on because it's it's a mishmash. It's all sorts of like notes that he's taking. He's rambling all over the place. I have actually brought it up in my uh, Worlds of Speculative Fiction um, sessions on Philip K. Dick. So if you go to those, you'll see me, you know, when we're talking about, um, for example, the difference between androids and humans and why that matters. He's got some passages in the exegesis where that's that's important, right? And I'll bring it in there, but I, I don't think I'll ever do videos specifically just on the exegesis um, because it's, you know, it's this thick, right? So I think it's that's one of those books, you know, I've, I've done this video on books with aura where, um, People like to talk about them, but very few people have actually read them entirely. Um, so I think the exegesis is like that. Uh, let's see here. Roman says, to clarify creative as in like a more broad, less historically rigorous interpretation or a reading that's suggestive of what the writer wants to achieve. Well, I mean, some of those readings are good and some of those are crap. A lot of times people engage in aceegesis rather than exegesis, uh, projecting what it is that they want to find in the text in the text. And I don't I don't find those particularly interesting or, or useful because I want to if I'm going to read secondary literature, I want to learn something about what the person is talking about. Right. Um, now, that said, there are some thinkers whose secondary lit is effectively what you're calling these creative interpretations that are quite interesting. I mean, Deleuze on the history of philosophy, you're always getting more Deleuze than you are the people that he's talking about. But, it, you know, it's, it's kind of cool. His Nietzsche book, his uh, Leibniz book, you know, Logic of Sense, uh, that's all fun stuff. Heidegger does that all the time, and I find his stuff kind of interesting as well. So... All right. Um, let's see. Gavin asked, what other books come to your mind you'd classify as books of war? I did a whole video on that, so you can easily look that up. Uh, September, what music have you been listening to lately? I mean, today I started the morning listening to some uh, uh, Judas Priest and some uh, uh, Tank, some Motorhead, some... Uh, Deep Purple, and uh, my favorite Black Sabbath song, Zero the Hero. Um, so, you know, mostly listen to metal. Um, by the way, Scott Truly and I are starting classic metal class back up again in November. <clears throat> Our schedules are now able to allow this. He's been doing a lot of gigging lately, so he hasn't had much time for, for that. But as the season comes to a bit of a close, he'll have a bit more time. And uh, we're going to resume that with uh, some discussions about ethical dimensions of how certain bands structure their concerts. Um, 
All right. Let's see here. Chase says the Kyoto School had interesting engagements with German thought, Hegel and Heidegger. Yeah, lots of people did. I mean, the Kyoto School is interesting. Jim Bow, would you ever cover Zizek? I've already talked about that earlier in this, this session. Zizek would be very, very low on my list. I mean, I guess you could say I cover him every time that people ask me questions about Zizek, don't I? You know, I basically have to say the same thing over and over again that he, uh, uh, you know, was rigorous in his early stuff, which was quite interesting. And now he's just kind of like shooting from the hip all the time. Um, all right. Um, so I'm going to go out on this question because it's already 1.30 and I've got another event coming up for uh, the Patreon supporters of the project, uh, a little bit more intimate celebration a little bit later on today. Mohiz Muhammad, do you do journaling if you find utility in it? I do not. And I have not found journaling helpful for me. Um, lots of people get lots of benefit out of it. And I'm kind of an outlier. So... I don't say that people shouldn't journal because I don't find it useful. I just find other things more useful for me, like just reading the text and thinking about them and, and applying them in my, my life. Um, but, you know, I, I do writing, non creative nonfiction stuff where I, like, remember things. But, yeah, I don't do, like, daily journaling. Um, I, I get that a lot of other people enjoy that. Um, I've tried it. I find I rarely go back to the stuff that I write in that way. And I don't get that many insights out of it, unfortunately. So sort of like being tone deaf, I suppose, right? All right. So uh, I am going to uh, say good, you know, good evening, good night, good afternoon, good morning to you wherever you are in the world. I'm glad all of you could join me for this uh, little celebration and Q&A and uh, you know, we've got cool stuff coming up. It won't be all necessarily Hegel related, although, I, you know, I kind of want to do some core, more core concept videos on Hegel down the line as well. But the next big project, which I, I'll be starting in November, not, not in October, because I've got so much going on in October, we'll be applying this methodology to um, St. Anselm's Proslogian, and then you know, that'll probably take a little while. Uh, and then I'll be doing it with Rene Descartes, the meditations on first philosophy, which is a wonderful work. And then we'll see about what big book I ought to do. Maybe I'll put a vote out there in social media down the line. So, you know, you might probably want to follow me uh, if you're not already in, in YouTube, getting, you know, using the uh, notifications thing, maybe in Twitter, if Twitter stays around, or uh, Facebook or the other things that I use. So, all right. Uh, by the way, I'll, I'll close this by saying thanks to everybody who's been supporting this project this entire time. Um, you know, it's, uh, it's a lot of work and um, it's been very helpful to have people who were encouraging about it, who said that they get some value from it. So, all right, that's enough. I will see all of you uh, down the line and we'll do some, uh, some other philosophers with the same sort of methodology.